So, uh, so this morning uh, I have the pleasure of introducing from Genoa, uh, Alberto Diaz. Uh, yeah, he's on. Thank you very much, Colin, and thank you for this chance to give a lecture, a second lecture here. Uh, so again, as I told you yesterday, in order to convince you that we are in the era of the extra microscope, reflecting the sentence in the Galilei's letter, uh, Today, I will focus on uh, nanoscale optical microscopy. Uh, I have some topics that I wanted to discuss yesterday at no time that are threat, that are fluorescence recovery of photobleaching, and maybe I will not be able to fully discuss about second harmonic generation and Müller matrix imaging. But in case we can discuss about these topics later or Let's see if we have time. Now I would like to touch this point related to nanoscale uh, optical microscopy and uh, focusing on uh, fluorescence nanoscopy. We will see that the keyword fluorescence is relevant in this case. As you have seen yesterday, one of the main uh, most important objects we are interested in, what well, I'm interested in, is the biological cell. It's the biological cell uh, for two reasons. And one reason is related to the fact that, uh, if you remember the Feynman lectures 1959, can be considered a nanomachine. So there is something that you can control or that this machinery controls at this level, nanometer level, that influences all the further steps at higher levels. The second issue is related to the fact that cell aggregation and the cell work uh, contribute to constitute organs, tissues, and uh, our living body, and so on. And so try to decipher what's going on in this complicated environment could help in understanding how to treat, for example, diseases, or more in general, to live better. Uh, now, here you find here this uh, sentence related to cell aggregates, small organisms, and um, organs and tissues. Why? Maybe because I'm getting old, but I would like to move from studies made having cells that people is calling living cells on cover slips, having a strong interaction with glass to cell aggregates, having strong interactions with themselves. And, and so our idea is to try to export what we know today in fluorescence nanoscopy to large objects when is needed. You don't need a super resolved imaging of the full body. But maybe at a certain time, a certain temporal interval, it would be interesting to have the possibility of penetrating in the full body or organ or tissues, uh, recognizing a region, and for that region being quantitative in terms of molecular biology. So this, this is the idea behind it. And at the end of this uh, talk, uh, yesterday, I liked very much this talk from the Oscan group about the portable uh, microscope. And I will show you a 50 cent microscope, if I remember, at the end, uh, that can be plugged in a iPhone or any other uh, device. So nanoscale optical microscopy. I don't know how many of you can recognize from this picture what's, what is behind. Uh, I cannot, I couldn't, now I know. Uh, but if I remove fog here, uh, improving spatial resolution, maybe some of you can recognize the nuclear pores in the nucleus. And so the fact that today 
we are able to describe the organization of the nuclear pore at the nanometric level, and we can try to start studying what's going on in terms of input and output in the nuclear pore with a very high precision, that is a nanometer scale, and using probes that are not affecting too much uh, the way the system is functioning, so light, visible light. And I like to bring to your attention this biological system that is chromatin DNA, because if you have a look here, you have uh, an object that is interesting because it is densely condensed in the nucleus with a lot of information available. And imagine, this information are released at the proper time, in the proper space, without uh, with a control that is made directly by the cell and by the organization of the cells. So it's like uh, the case that you have a library with millions of books inside, and you're passing in front of this library with your bike, and there is one librarian coming out, running to you, and bringing to you a specific book open at a certain page in order to give you the information for your next step. It's amazing. If a librarian is wrong in the book, in the page, or you cannot read very well what is written there, you can be in troubles. Okay. So now, inside here, there is this great library with a lot of information. But then, if you get out, you see that you have different level of organization that are inter of interest. Why? Uh, if, of interest for microscopy. Why? Because this extraordinary microscope today allows us to tune, as I told you, as a radio, the spatial resolution. Simply turning a knob, you can move from 200 nanometer down to 100, 80, 20 if you need. And then you have to start thinking because what you want to do is working room temperature, KT, Boltzmann constant, and uh, living systems. So you can push down to one nanometer, but then you have some problems with the activity of your system itself. And so what we can do with the nanoscale optical microscopy is to tune spatial resolution according to our needs. Or and I think this is the important issue, according to your question. So before moving to the nanoscale using the microscope, let's start having a question. And for this question, you need certain resolution. And then you move to your instrument. It's not like a washing machine. It's not that you put inside your cells, and then you select a program offering you the best resolution, and then you get the data, and then you don't know what to do with this data because you, you had the appropriate question. Okay, so there is a chain here. Now, if you have a look to this uh, optical microscopy scenario again, like yesterday, you see, again, it's rather complicated. And today, we will try to link these two keywords, optics approach and probes approach. Yesterday, we were more discussing about probes approach. I'm sorry, I didn't discuss about FRET. We can do later, but uh, today, there is a mix here. And within this mix, you have, uh, in this forest of methods, you have so many methods developed according to different interests in optics or to different questions in, in biology and in medicine. Now, every time there is a new microscope in optical microscopy, there is a question that people is not posing for developments in electron microscopy. Usually, when you have electron microscopy, people say, OK, that's fine. We can get a very high resolution, uh, forgetting that you have to solidify uh, the sample, physically cut the sample, metallize the sample, uh, sending electrons, and so on. So forgetting about this. But no questions about, for example, living systems. So the very first question is, are you able to play with living systems? What about resolution? Fine. 
Multidimensionality, yes, because now you are using light. And you have seen in these days, or any other mechanism of contrast, thermal or optical, and then you try to produce an image. And so you can try to combine all this information in an image. And so when you touch your image, you get information about fluorescence, about refractive index, uh, about thermal properties, about everything. And you can have today this knowledge all together in your image. Uh, and then uh, uh, there is something related to versatility. Of course, you don't want too many artifacts. And you need to be able to recognize them. Uh, sample preparation. And people is also asking for about system complexity when they want to use the, the microscope. It seems that when people is approaching the microscope, no one wants to learn something behind the microscope. They simply want to use the microscope. And so they want something simple in terms of use. It's not. Uh, if you want to get important information, you have to design your experiment with your microscope and with your biological question. So nothing is simple. Uh, otherwise, everybody can ask. You, you can buy it in the supermarket. That you can do, but then it's not so simple to use it and to understand what's going on. And if you have a look from the 80s up to today, uh, two years ago, <laughs> distance between optical microscopy and electron microscopy is something that today is confused, is mixed. So you're approaching this kind of spatial resolution. Now, I have uh, the great privilege of having the possibility of having a victim for some discussion related to super resolution that is having the possibility of talking not too much as I wanted or as I want with Colin Shepard uh, about super resolution and resolution issues and not only. But I like to remind that the term super resolution was in some way brought to the attention of the people by another Italian scientist. So we started from Galileo Galilei, and now we have Giuliano Toraldo di Francia. Now, apart from going in detail with the paper, or with papers by Giuliano Toraldo di Francia, I think that it's not wrong to think that uh, the message was, you cannot do anything against physical laws diffraction. Simply, you have to consider that you have this limitation. That is not a limitation. It's also something that you can get. So it's, it's what you can get with your instrument in terms of space, in terms of time. But what you can do in treating information coming from this uh, limit, physically limited instrument, in case you have some other information outside from the direct acquisition channel of your microscope, you can merge your information coming from the microscope with information, with an a priori or additional set of information. And merging them, you can take advantage and you can increase your ability, for example, in getting a better spatial resolution. Uh, and if you want to, I think this is a good reading, but another very good reading is a recent paper by Colin Shepard that you can find in open access on this journal. Simply, you can go to this journal and you can download for one month uh, this paper. And is an excellent discussion in terms of resolution and super resolution and telling you something about the super cited uh, Abbe paper. Uh, and which is the real relationship between the Abbe paper, the formula, and citations that this paper is getting when people is talking about super resolution. So now you have uh, your system. In order to describe your system, well, you can have uh, a plot of a, a intensity along the line, and in case you have this frequency or this, or in case you have this behavior or this behavior, you can understand that if you want to switch to frequencies, you have high frequencies or low frequencies. So you can associate the frequency concept to space, 
And you can think that uh, when uh, your sample has to transmit high frequencies, these are high resolution data, spatial resolution data, so something changing very fast in space, distances very close one to the other, and when the system is more relaxed in these changes, you have low frequencies. Then you have your system, and since we are talking about frequencies, uh, you know, and you had uh, last week uh, lessons about this, you have a cutoff of frequency. Now, if for, if for some reason you can introduce data that allow you to have something behind this frequency of cutoff, and you go back to space, in that case, you can have super resolution. Now, I don't know if uh, I will mention all the resolution criteria that uh, people is using when he's looking to an image and trying to say which is the current resolution. This is relevant. <laughs> Um, and I will show you an example uh, immediately after these few, uh, few points. It is relevant because now let's assume that you have uh, an appropriate question. And this question has at score, as its core, the fact that uh, you want to learn something at a certain resolution. You want to get information at a certain resolution. If you have this, when you look at your image, you can say something about what's going on that is related to the real resolution of the image. So if you think that one dot can be discriminated in terms of distance with another at the resolution of 10 nanometer, you can say something. If you know that you cannot discriminate distances before then, I don't know, 500 nanometer, your conclusion is not the same, right? So you want to be sure that you have something in your hands that allow you to say which is the objective resolution, uh, resolution in your image. Uh, well, you can, and you have seen in last week, last week some models. You can have some analytical formulation of the process. You can try to model your microscope, and you can try to model your system, and then you can try to find the solution about it. Uh, the resolution you have. Or, more recently, you can have uh, calibration samples that are of the very same family of the samples you're interested in, so biological samples. And so, for example, you can use what are known today as uh, DNA origami. So you're able to place in precise positions fluorescent labels, and so these uh, is good for understanding which could be the resolution of your system when you have a biological system under the microscope. It's not completely true, because if you remember the slide about chromatin DNA, one issue is the one related to a chain where you have uh, spotted your fluorescent probes, and then the big mess that you have inside the nucleus also with changes in the refractive index and so on. So a lot of additional issues. But you are close to the best performances of your system. Or what you can do is to have a, a line profile in your image. And using this line profile, as in this case, you can speculate and say something about resolution using Sparrow Criterium or Riley Criterium uh, to say which is your confidence in saying that you have a certain spatial resolution. This case is interesting, but uh, brings you to this. There is one point here. When you perform this line, uh, um, intensity profile, it seems that you recognize the object. So you are looking to something that you recognize that probably you knew before. It's good because you have some confirmation, but maybe 
cannot tell you something really new about your sample. Then there is another method that is called Fourierring correlation that uh, can allow you to get uh, a, an objective uh, evaluation of the current spatial resolution you have with the microscope you're using for the sample you're interested in. In order to have this estimate uh, of your imaging system, uh, what you need is uh, you don't need any a priori information. Uh, you use your optical system as it is, so the system you're currently using. Um, you collect images from your sample and the only constraint is that you need two identical but statistically independent images uh, of the same sample. The very simple way for doing this is collecting two successive images. Today you have uh, detectors that allow you to collect in different position of your detector the two or pixels in your detector the two independent images. So you have some possibilities in this. When you have done this, you perform your Fourier transformation. And then through correlation here, you can find the cutoff frequency, which is the good point here. It's not only that you're able to find the effective cutoff frequency. You have to, so it's not simple, and it's not again, a washing machine. You have to clearly define which, are, which is the threshold in your system, where the noise is trying to bury this, the signal you are interested in. So threshold is an issue here, and you have to work on this. But when you define the threshold, you can find your effective uh, cutoff frequency. So now, if you try to perform this game using uh, DNA origami. This is a conventional imaging, and uh, this is the cutoff frequency, this low frequency. And when you apply a super-resolved method, you see that you can distinguish them, the two dots, and, but without looking to the image, so you're not uh, biased by what you want to to find, because you know that you have DNA origami. So it's easy for you to see clearly that there are two spots. But without look, watching the image, uh, you can, again, find your uh, effective cutoff frequency, demonstrating that you had an improve, and this is in tune with what you were thinking about your system. This is a recent paper by Christoph Kremer. And he had some questions, uh, the paper will be shown uh, in the next slide, about chromatin DNA distribution in the nucleus, so the big mass that you had there. In order to be able to say something about what you're watching here, what, which is the meaning of this image in terms of biological question yet, you really need to have a, a clear view of which is the current resolution you have with your microscope. You can try to have line intensity or to recognize something, but it's not so easy in this case. They are not filaments that you can recognize. These are not DNA origami. And so what he decided to do in order to have an idea of the resolution is performing FRC. With FRC, he knows now that for his conclusion on that set of images, he can trust in the fact that he is examining something that in terms of spatial resolution is a spatial resolution of 37 nanometer. Is this enough for answering his question or not? And so you can start analyzing. This, just for giving you this message, I think that is uh, uh, something interesting when you start working in the super resolved fluorescence microscopy domain. So now, uh, making shorter a long story, uh, you have your fluorescent molecules at distances closer than the diffraction limit. 
And this is what you get with your best microscope. Cheap or expensive, but this is what you can get. And this is what you can get with a super resolved microscope. And uh, simply comparing in a visual way these two images, you see that this uh, report about what's going on in your system is more uh, close to the original and distribution of the object. Of course, you can speculate and you can say something also here. I'm not saying that you cannot say anything at this resolution. You can use all your information about the system. You can use everything. So and people have done this for uh, 100 years. So you can do that. But I think that you are facilitated if you are in this domain. I will not mention uh, among the super resolved uh, fluorescent method this approach, the structure of the illumination microscopy. This is an approach developed by Max Gustafsson. Um, that uh, was developed in the early times of, uh, let's say, super resolved microscopy. And probably, I'm not sure, but maybe Rainer Heinzmann will discuss about this method on his uh, topical lecture on the 23. Uh, but just to tell you that there is a method that allows you to move from this condition to this one, so increasing the spatial resolution using fluorescence and using an approach that is in the frequency domain. We can discuss in case about this later, but and you will have a discussion maybe with Reiner. But this is one of the methods. In the very same scenario of super resolved method, I will not talk too much, but only showing you another new method that is not related to the super resolved method that are the central core of this lecture and are related with the Nobel Prize given in 2014. And uh, this method I like because I have the excuse to bring to your attention my granddaughter uh, because she has this question. Can we install polymer chains of swellable material? Uh, here, she has a problem with diapers. So the question is related to how much volume increases when she's providing liquid and other substances to this object. Now, I'm telling you about this because there is a method called expansion microscopy that is a sort of diaper for your uh, biological object. This was introduced by Ed Boyden that provided me some slides. And the idea is making a souffle uh, with your sample. So you have your sample. You label your sample with fluorescent molecules. Then you introduce, you, you start a process of jellification that cross-links with the fluorescent molecules. Then you place, then you start adding water, as your RNA is doing, and the system grows. Keeping homogeneity in the three directions, and having an effect on the cross-linked molecules, fluorescent molecules, this is the following. In case they were closer than the diffraction limit, now they are physically moved apart. And so you have them at distances that you can detect with the diffraction limited system. There are a lot of limitations in this uh, application. You can, uh, you can say whatever you want in terms of the preparation of the sample, always have in mind what you do to your sample when you prepare them for the electron microscope before uh, exhibiting too much criticism on this. But the system is, uh, starts from chemistry, and so you have this object here, this dimension, and then you have uh, your diaper growing overnight, for example. You have some, uh, in, speaking about some technicalities, you have some technical problem because you can imagine that at the beginning you had a small sample under your microscope and now you have a sample that is five times large, larger than the one before. Uh, 
So it's important, technically speaking, that you are able to perform mosaicing. Probably you cannot use the microscope in the very same way. You have to move your up. But you can use any microscope, any wide field microscope you can have in your lab in order to increase your ability in detecting things that are at distances closer than the refraction limit at the beginning of the story. Um, and you can go through. The, there are only, I think, few papers. One is on science, one on cell, and one on nature methods, and another one on natural nanotechnology. So four papers about this method. The main difference between the very first paper, science paper, is that in the science paper, they are mentioning specific fluorescent molecules. So this was the main drawback. When you move to the natural methods paper, and specific uh, molecules, and they were destroying everything within the sample. In the next, there is something that is a little bit more dirty in terms of final object. And this is that uh, you can use any fluorescent molecule. And then you cut links in the sample. You don't destroy everything. You cut links. And so you allow your system to expand. Uh, this is what we have done. We tried. We decided to start with this method. So this is the pre-expansion. Pre and this is what you get after expansion. And you see that you have, uh, visually, you have an increase of resolution. And so the, just in case you can be interested, uh, we started working with this uh, protocol. And we found this interesting. So this is what you do. Uh, you have these steps that are uh, labeling, gelation, and digestion. And then uh, you place your sample in water overnight, and then you get a sample increase in terms of volume. So this fixation for some of you from chemistry or biochemistry interested is this. Uh, you can perform any labeling. And this is the physical object you have in your hands. And you have a technical, real technical problem. Because uh, now, how can you address the question, how many times did you enlarge the sample? You need a region in the initial image and the region in the final image. And so comparing them, you can say something about the expansion. It's not so easy to find the very same position when you're performing this series of operations in the system. I have to say that Isotta Cainero, that is a student uh, in our lab, is, became particularly skilled in finding the very same cell from the pre-expansion to the post-expansion. And so this is a water effect. And this is your sample growing. And this is the effect. So this is the pre-expansion. So this is what you can get. And this is what you can get after. It's not a big increase. Uh, it's not unlimited resolution. But maybe, depending on your question and the condition of your sample, this can be enough, and you can simply use your, the microscope you have in your lab, any microscope. Oh, again, here, uh, so sorry for this. Again, the image you have seen before. And then we decided to have uh, another step here. And the further step is to apply a super resolved method that we will discuss immediately later uh, to the expulsion microscopy object. Why? Because in this case, I can expand. And then I can move to a super resolved method that I have as available, not pushing too much with the method, because I already start from a situation that is two times or three times better than the initial sample. And so maybe you can get a further advantage in using a super resolved method across and expand the sample with respect to the original sample in different colors and so on. So you know that. So we start. So th this is just to premise for other methods that I will not discuss now. Uh, and you have your eye 
conventional microscope and here where you are theoretically unlimited. Again, limitation comes from the fact now that you want to work room temperature and on living systems. You know probably these three guys, but uh, what I want to bring to your attention is this sentence. There are all the keywords. It's a very short sentence that tells you everything about the motivation. There is the development. So work started in the 90s. Uh, there is microscopy. And there is the keyword for chemistry, that is fluorescence. That's the key word we discussed yesterday about fluorescence. And if you have a look to this uh, review paper by one of them, Stefanel, uh, there is this sentence that uh, well, I found for the first time uh, referred to diffraction barrier. That is, diffraction barrier is crumbling. It's not overcome, it's not surpassed, it's not violated. It's crumbling. It's gretolata. Now, the verb, now it's difficult to find another verb, and so we decided to introduce this circumvented. Uh, the rule is this one. You simply need to be able to preclude the simultaneous emission of adjacent, so object closer than the refraction limit, spectrally identical fluorophores. Simple. If you're able to preclude this, you're able to perform super resolved fluorescence microscopy. But this is relevant also because uh, it does not only apply to fluorescence and not fluorescence, but you can apply this to any state you're able to control. It would be absorption or not absorption. If you're able to place in a very specific way something like uh, the Harry Potter mantle becoming, having something becoming transparent, you can work in transmission. Or you can play with scattering, not scattering, spin up and spin down. It's in your hands what, what you're able to control and what you can get in terms of this approach. And so when you have your beam waste, so beam from your microscope, from your illumination, you have these objects here. and. Uh, your limitation in terms of resolution is that you don't know uh, which one of these objects is responsible from this, which position is responsible for this fluorescence. Murner and Betzig decided to find a way for convincing molecules not to emit all together, but to emit in discrete clusters made of sparse a sparse molecule distribution of molecules. This means, please, don't single together. Only few of you, but in sparse positions. So one here, one here. A distance is larger than my limits in, in finding you. And if you play this game, for me, it's easier to find your position. And when I'm sure that you are the singer, and if you continue singing, I can refine my knowledge in terms of your localization. This is what is done. Of course, if I want to determine positions of all of you, I have to wait that the first singers stop singing, and I ask next singer to start singing, and so on. And this is with fluorescence. I need a several steps to do this. Uh, the other point developed by Stefanel is something that is an improvement with respect to what you do with confocal microscopy. Also, when you move from wide field microscopy to confocal microscopy to a scanning system, you are improving the spatial resolution, a factor of square root of two all directions with the confocal microscope. And if you think what's going on, is that uh, you're adding an additional information to your acquisition scheme. Because when you perform scanning and confocal microscopy, 
you know the position of your laser beam. You don't have this knowledge when you perform wide field microscopy, and so your resolution is the resolution. Now here you can add something. In case of STED, and we will see later what is, you are adding a second knowledge that is related to the fact that we will be using a second beam, and we know exactly where this second beam is, and which is the region that this second beam is perturbing in order to restrict the signal to the region you are interested in. But if you think in terms of uh, channel of information that you have at your disposal, you have a diffraction limited system plus additional information about what you're doing, about the overall system you are using for forming your image. And so here, in case of the Merner basic approach, and in case you know that you are dealing with a single molecule, that's your target. This is the reason why yesterday we discussed more on how to recognize a single molecule. So when people is performing single molecule localization microscopy, super resolved single molecule localization microscopy, uh, behind there is the fact that they are sure that they are dealing with single molecules. It's not something, again, it's not simple. It's not that you switch on and you say, okay, let's, okay, let's collect our single molecule imaging. No. And for example, also in cases when you want to track single molecules, you have to know that this is a single molecule. And so you have to use all the knowledge or all the tools we have shown yesterday in order to learn how to recognize a single molecule and to be sure that it's a single molecule. And then you can start with your imaging, okay? And if you know that the emitter is a single molecule, you can refine the knowledge or the error that you have in terms of localizing your molecule of a factor square root of n, where n is the number of photons that you are able to collect from your molecule. In case your molecule is able to send you an infinite number of photons, you are very, very precise in terms of localization. But think that in case you are, in a real case, that your molecule is able to provide 10,000 photons, you are improving uh, 100 times your precision of localization with respect to the conventional approach. If you move to the, and I will be back, of course, on this too, uh, on the Stefanel method, you have your second beam. Uh, now, there is an analogy also with confocal microscopy that is related to the fact that also in this room, how, how can you increase your ability in watching a colleague in this room uh, without spending money? Please remember, I come from Genoa, so don't ask me to improve, to increase light dose here. There is a, an associated cost. But how can you play this game? Can we agree that if you play in this way, so you confine your observation to a point in this physical way, contrast increases, and then if you want to see everything, you simply scan. And when you design your experiment, you know that uh, what you have to pay for this improvement in terms of contrast is that in case some of you is moving too slow or too fast, I can see air or him twice or never or three times. But this is part of the design of your experiment. And so in this case, the second beam, graphically speaking, but not physically speaking, is uh, like shrinking the region from which the information is coming and impinging the detector that is detecting photons. So when you increase the power in the second beam, the intensity in the second beam, the graphical effect is like shrinking this. And so you can put, so in the center of this, you do nothing. And you see the original fluorescence in case there are objects there. 
And so if you write something here, what you see is something like this. And then when you perform this uh, single molecule, you see something like this. And, and uh, again, with uh, the other method, you see something like this. And here, you can appreciate immediately something. This was uh, your system with some information in the fog. Now, not only you can distinguish that is written IIIT, but you can also ca start thinking that you can count molecules uh, assembling this information region by region. So this is, the, is not only an improvement in spatial resolution, but in, in your quantitative ability. So single molecule approach. Uh, let's start with this. I try to be faster now. Uh, you ask the molecules to come to your attention, not all together. Uh, if you want, uh, you can start from these. Uh, these are nice movies that you can find uh, on the websites. And that tells you what you are doing when you are collecting photons or, in general, information from a source of information. When you perform this game and you have a limited channel in terms of view, you can start from this relationship if you want, if you like. But what is relevant here is that uh, if you analyze this and the variation of momentum in this case, so your, the error or the uncertainty that you have, and you consider your width of your channel and the amount of information you are collected, you can come, you can go here. And that is something that reminds you what is known as the Abbe formula at the end about uh, your uncertainty that you have in determining the position of an object in space. And this is what happens here, is that you have these single molecules that are at distances larger than the diffraction limit. This is the profile you have, distribution that you have. And if you continue collecting photons from this, you can refine this information in this way. Again, keyword is in the preparation of the sample and in the fact that you are sure that you're collecting data from a single molecule, from a single fluorescent source. If not, you cannot say anything. These are Betsig and Harald S, some way, uh, when they developed the microscope. Uh, I think Harald S house was, because I think that Betsig was married, was not allowed to build the microscope in the main room. And uh, instead of watching to the system in this way, like when you watch to the sky, they were able, in convincing molecules, to emit uh, not all together, but uh, one by one, they were able to detect their position in a very precise way, getting the advantage that you know today. So these are molecules convinced emitting not all together. And at the end, you have an improvement in terms of localization precision for each of these objects that allows you to have, at the end, what we call today, uh, right or wrong, that is, a super resolved image. So this was the paper by Betzig, uh, Betzig and Des in 2006. And I bring to your attention this fact that this date, submission date, March 2006, uh, you will see some other paper related to this topic in the very same year. But please remember this data. And you also see, can see the public acceptance data and publication date. date. Uh, so what they did? What they did was to collect uh, an increasing number of photons from single molecules. When you collect uh, this number, you can get uh, this precision of localization. When you collect this, you can improve, and you can improve again. Uh, this was the scheme. 
So you have your molecules coming not all together. You can put them together getting a conventional image. Or, I'm sorry, I go to the next that is larger. Okay. And uh, if instead of putting all together in a single image, you put here something related to your localization precision that is given by this relationship at the first approximation, uh, you can get a better description of the position of the objects in the sample. Here, I don't mind all these uh, parameters now. Uh, I've shown before what they are, but what the relevant ones are n, that is the number of photons collected from the single molecule, and unfortunately, B, that is background. So our photons coming from something that you don't know, you're not interested in. Uh, and then there are some technicalities about mm, pixelation and about uh, the system you're using. Okay. In the very same year, but submitted in June, there was this paper by Sam S, not Harold S, but Sam S, playing the very same game on the cell. Betzig and Harald S were very bright and clever in uh, defining their sample. So they decided to use a very thin sample, 100 nanometer, using for excitation, not a conventional microscope, but a TIRF microscope. So confining the excitation in a very small region. And the reason was that they wanted to eliminate as much as possible background. Sam did the very same game in a biological cell. He submitted to Biophysical Journal, publication was later, acceptation was later, and uh, submission too. In the very same year, Shouwei Zhuang published a similar paper, but here you can see that uh, uh, this was submitted in July, the very same year. And here, the mechanism is different is not controlling two states like uh, bright and dark, but two colors. Doesn't matter. What you, the final result you want to have is that you don't want in your acquisition, current acquisition scheme something that is disturbing your localization precision. So it doesn't matter if you're switching across colors or bright and dark. And she performed this game. And so this is what you got before. And this is what you get after the application of this. What you have to pay? Come on, 40,000 frames. And uh, this number of points to be localized. 40,000 frames because I'm asking to this chorus, all the singers, not to sing all together. One here, one here, one here. Then stop, then start again. And then at, at the end, I mix, and I get uh, uh, the final song. And so I need this number of frames. We can discuss about the stop criterion in collecting frames. When do you stop collecting frames? When you recognize the object. This means, so my question now is, if you recognize the object and you stop when you recognize the object, why did you perform imaging? You already knew what you wanted to have. So there should be a criterion for there, for this. Uh, and I want to bring to your attention this that maybe is the only thing I can tell this morning about labor free. Uh, that is, there is this recent paper uh, by Bachmann Group that is a super resolution that is using intrinsic fluorescence. So it's a labor free method. You don't need to label your sample, you can exploit some intrinsic fluorescence. Uh, they decided to call this uh, in a different way, so photon localization microscopy instead of single molecule. It doesn't matter. The only thing behind is that uh, the autofluorescence is in some way driven by the dense, local density of DNA. So you have you have to take care in 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 in. Uh, in preparing your sample and in defining 
your experiment because it's not that you have uh, autofluorescence uh, from all the DNA you have at your disposal, but you have autofluorescence also as function of the availability of, of uh, detectable autofluorescence that is related to the density. Okay, let me, I will not discuss about this method. Okay, I know, okay, I want to discuss about this. Now, single molecule localization. This is your sample. You are very good in inserting your labels. Now you are very precise in localizing their position and you get something that is close to your sample. Good. Same sample. You are not so good for some reasons in localizing very well your labels. Could be that your molecules undergo photobleaching faster and so you are not able to collect a large number of photons. And so you get this, that is close to this, but not sure that information is the same. Or you are poor in labeling and precise in localization, and you get this. Or your molecules are moving while you are performing your frames. 40 thousands, you can imagine that even for a fixed sample, you can have some motion, or if you want to go to the living sample, you have to take into account this. But this is not so negative as it seems, because in the last 10, 15 years, people became skilled in particle tracking. And so with the living sample and with this method, you can find a solution for using your tracking ability in repositioning the objects where it has to be. Okay, so, okay. so it's not, nothing is completely lost due to the motion of the molecules. And uh, okay, then you have to decide uh, how precise you want to be, so number of photons you collect, or number of frames, and you have different images at your disposal. And so you're sorry for is, but you can see that here you have some molecules and your, and this is network of your molecules here. This looks like a conventional image with the exception that uh, you know their position with a precision of 15 nanometers. We can say we're pointless painters and you can decide if you want to spend your 2,000, 40,000 frames, 200, I don't know how many frames, in order to get a view that is not this one, but is this one, to answer your biological question. If this is relevant, do that. If for your question this is enough, no reason for collecting 40,000 frames. And I've shown images coming from cytoskeleton filament, something that you can easily recognize, something that is flat, something that is on a cover slip, really not a revolutionary environment, but a relaxed environment for the cell. Uh, but now we are more interested in, uh, for example, in uh, aggregate of cells. Yes, because if you want to understand, now we have a tool that allows you to uh, find the position, and in some case dynamics, related to single molecules. So why not starting using this for aggregate of cells and not at the interface with the glass? This is a tumor spheroid, so we decided to couple two methods. Uh, I, I did not discuss yesterday about this method, but this is a method that for which you are less lazy than usual, I will comment later about this, is cutting your sample with a plane of illumination, collecting information 90 degrees apart. Why people is doing this, why we are doing this, because have you seen in the Betsig uh, slide, the major enemy is background. And so when I'm trying to collect information, collecting from this direction, I have a lot of background coming from Addison planes for a big object, a 
so I'm in troubles with my precision localization. But if I am able to reduce in a significant way background, I can improve my ability in precision localization. So this is a, uh, a way for doing this with some drawbacks, but it works. And then within this plane of illumination, thicknesses from one micron to two micron can be uh, even sharper. Uh, you can apply here super resolution detection. And so when you navigate through your sample with this plane, up to 100, and now today 200 nanometer, you can collect single molecules plane by plane, single molecule position, and then you can get a localization position of 28 nanometers. Looks good, but it's bad. It's bad because these 28 nanometers are lost in 2,000 nanometers of the thickness of the plane of illumination. <laughs> it's good having this XY, but okay. So from Showazewang came the suggestion of using some asymmetry in the system, and you can imagine that this is the thickness of the. Let's imagine this. This is the thickness of the plane of illumination. And now you, have, uh, you are 90 degrees apart. Okay? And now you see signature from your molecules, single molecules. And when you see that due to the illumination that you are using now, so some astigmatism introduced in the system, when you see a round-shaped signature, this is a molecule in the focal region, in the focal position. But when the molecule is moving apart from the focus of the lens, it becomes stretched in one direction or in the other direction in an ellipsoidal shape. You perform a calibration. You have these curves of calibration, and they allow you to find the position within the plane of illumination with a better precision than the conventional you can get uh, with your microscope. And so you can perform also z-axis super resolution, like in this case, 35 and 65 for molecules that are in the membrane of a nanocapsule. Doesn't matter what it is, but it's an artificial sample. Small. Then when you go in your thick object, you are in troubles. Why? Because in order to perform this calibration, you can be you can try not, under, not to understand the problem, and so you can say, okay, come on, let me calibrate using beads. Great. But beads provide an enormous number of photons are available. Your sample is real. So when you have a thick sample, our suggestion is that you go inside, you find a region where you have a sub-resolved cluster of object, and you perform there your calibration with the astigmatism. And so you have the real situation also in terms of release photon. In this case, the situation is worse, so it's 63, 141 along the z-axis, but you can call this, again, super-resolved uh, imaging. And so you can find the region in your cluster of cells, and in the region of interest, you can have your super-resolved image localized in a precise way in the cell aggregate. Yesterday, we were discussing about uh, two-photon excitation. And uh, you see that here, you used, uh, as first step, uh, photoactivation of your single molecules. Uh, I'm sorry that I missed telling you, well, you didn't ask and I missed, to tell you how you convince molecules to emit not altogether. What you're using are photoactivatable molecules. In photoactivatable molecules, you can control states, dark and bright. So when you decide to have them bright, you shine some light. This induces a photoconversion. And starting from that point, you have them bright. How to have a sparse set of molecules. Well, reducing, you need the photophysical knowledge of your molecules, but reducing a lot the photoactivation 
uh, intensity. So if you have a very poor photoactivation, your probability of photoactivating is poor, and the probability of having the photoactivated the distance is larger, not clusterized, but the distance is larger than the differential limit is higher. When you perform this game in a thick object using single photon photoactivation, we have the effect we have discussed yesterday. So you have a lot of scattering, first of all, because of the wavelength, and then you have a lot of noise or photoactivation in from position that you don't like. But what about using two photon photoactivation? In this case, you are moving to the red. You can penetrate more in your sample. And even if you have a scattering, because the sample is scattering due to its properties, a large sample is a scattering sample, you can be homogeneous in the thickness of the plane of illumination due to the fact that you are killing scattering, that you are not able to kill when you perform single photon photoactivation. And so, okay, so this is what happens. This is the single photon, two photon. Now when you have a scattering sample, scattering sample, this is the condition with single photon and two photon. We did this and you can perform this game in terms of photoactivation. In terms of photo, in terms of two photon excitation, it's nice, but we discussed yesterday about the fact that two photon excitation is not the best way for extracting photon from a frozen molecule uh, because the efficiency is not very high. There are a lot of other properties, but not the efficiency in extracting photons. Okay. Now I move to the last part. Um, and I change, I move from single molecule localization super resolution to targeted super resolution. So the Stefanel method or the STED method, the method where I use the knowledge of the position of the first excitation beam and of a second beam that I call depletion beam. We will see about this immediately. Uh, again, you can find, I don't know why, this time I decided to find these movies, and, but they are available and they are nice in, 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 in different websites, these cartoons. Uh, what about the method? What do you do? You have your uh, excitation spectrum in fluorescence, and uh, you remember that uh, uh, is independent from the region where you are performing excitation. This is your probability of emission. You can see this also as the possibility of the molecule to explore energy states in coming back to the ground state. Okay. These are the possibilities. Let me say that we can say that this is green and this is red. Okay, Just to have some keyword that we can use when you have uh, the... So you have your excitation. You bring the molecule to the excited state. When they are in the excited state, they do something for 10 minus 12 seconds. Telephone call, so something. So there is energy, some energy lost. And so you have, uh, in case they are fluorescent, you have an emission at the wavelength that is longer than the excitation. But everything that we discussed yesterday, fine. Now. When your molecules are in the excited state, since they are fluorescent molecules, it's natural for them, with the quantum yield that you can define, as we defined yesterday, to jump down from this terrace to the ground state. They will do that. And they will follow, uh, most of them, they will follow this route. And so since you're interested in them and the way they go down, also your acquisition of information is confined in this region. So if you know that they jump down from the terrace in this position, you, you set there your camera and you collect the information, okay? And you see them when they jump down. Now what happens if someone goes to the terrace 
and decide to push all of them down on another route except one or two of them. That what you see are only the ones that will jump down in the region where you're focused. You don't see all the others because they've been pushed out, jumping to the rocks or somewhere there. Okay. And this is what you can do with the second beam. You have a second beam here. Why you select a region in the emission spectrum? Because uh, you need to use an energy that an energy that can be explored by the molecule. So you could also put this second beam here. Or you could put this second beam here. But the problem you have, if you place this second beam closer to the excitation curve, is that you increase the probability of re-exciting. Re so you're pushing people down, and you're helping people coming up. You don't want to do this. And so you stay in the region where you can simply push them down here. Okay? And so this is what you do with the second beam. Now, if you have a look to this process with two round-shaped beams, you shine the excitation, and you collect fluorescence. One. Now you switch on a second beam in the red, that is the one responsible of pushing them through another pathway. You see that as function of the intensity of this second beam, you have a decrease of the signal of fluorescence that you see in the green. Okay. You are depopulating uh, in an artificial way excited states. I need only one definition that is intensity of saturation, saturation to zero, that is the intensity of the second beam that you need for depopulating 50% the excited state. This only definition matters. So just to tell you what is IS. If you have a look to resolution, uh, and we will see immediately after this, you find that uh, the strength of your shrinking, so the resolution that influences the resolution while you're scanning, is a function of this ratio, I divided by IS. I is the intensity of the second beam. This is what you put, this is, is what is in your hands like uh, the lens, and like your laser, like everything you have in your hands. But IS, for the first time, in such a relationship related to spatial resolution, is a photophysical property of the molecule you are working with. It's something related to that molecule at that wavelength. It's not related to the optics you're using. So in case you have friends able to produce for you molecules having a very poor, very small IS, you can use this laser pointer as a second beam for producing super resolution. Unfortunately, it's not, and so you need a very high intensity. I will be back on this topic later. So since you are still pointless painters, this is your brush with a conventional microscope, with a confocal microscope, and this is your brush with the stead microscope. Why? Because instead of providing the second beam as round shaped, I provide the second beam as donut shaped. Donut shaped means that I try to push molecules down in well-known spatial region, so I know exactly from which position I do this game. And I also know exactly that I will do nothing at the molecules that are, I try to do nothing at the molecules that are at the center of the donut. The only requirement is that you have at least one zero in the center in terms of intensity. Then if you shine your donut beam to the wall and you try to measure the dark part, system that you're using is diffraction limited, and even if you increase your intensity, you measure 200 nanometers. 
because you are using a different. But what matters is the distribution of the intensity that is the one that is influencing the resolution that you can get, the intensity profile. Now, think about this, uh, even if I'm late, but I can manage. Uh, here you have fluorescent molecules. And you are using the second beam for perturbing, if you want, in the near field, if you, wherever, whatever you can have in mind, locally, fluorescence conditions. What are you doing? I will be back on this later. Not too much later, but later. What are you doing? What does it mean, perturbing? You are offering to your fluorescent molecule another possibility to deactivate and go into the ground state. You remember yesterday when we discussed about lifetime, about the rates of fluorescence, not radiative. We are offering another possibility to the molecule. We will see the influence of this. And then, if you want to use the Abbe formula, uh, you have this uh, D that is ruled by this relationship until here. Then you add this element. And when you switch off your second beam, I, you have the original formula. So you can use this for trying to estimate which is the final resolution you can get in your system. The best is using FRC. Pointless painters again. And the reason why I like this method, uh, since ever, is because when I switch on a second beam, I immediately have the effect I want to have. Like with the radio, when I want to switch to another channel, I simply turn the knob. This is the image you can get on beads, 40 nanometer beads using a confocal microscope. And then you switch on the second beam, and you immediately get this. No processing, no frames to be collected, simply switched on a second beam. And when you go into the cell, you can play the very same game. You can move across your system, improving locally resolution or improving overall the resolution, spatial resolution in your system, switching on a second beam. And if they were, this was you got from synaptic connection, this is what you can get even better. You can perform this in the real time. Real time means the delayed time that you have in confocal microscopy due to the scanning. You can have this in colors and along the third axis. But now, I want to bring your attention to this point. Confocal means I0, second beam, off. Then I switch on the second beam. Uh, I'm using this number just to give you an idea of the power. It doesn't matter. It depends on the real condition of this. Our 50 milliwatt on the back focal plane. And I get this improvement. 200 milliwatt, I get this improvement. Okay? This is fine. It comes from the description we had before. Now, let me skip this, because I want to, ah, no, OK, stupid guy. Sorry. Now, OK, uh, let's try to find ways for reducing the power of the second beam for a very, for some simple reasons, at least two. The first one is an economic reason. If I'm able to reduce the intensity of the second beam, I'll need uh, cheap lasers. Good. The other one is that it's true that I'm working in the infrared on the tail of the emission, that I'm telling the story that systems do not absorb that wavelength in the red and so on, but it's not true. It's not true that they do not absorb at all. But it's true that I'm using an enormous amount of light there. So 
this large amount of light multiplied by something that is not exactly zero makes something. This means I can re-excite, and when I re-excite, I increase the probability of bringing the molecule to the photobleaching condition so that we discussed yesterday. So never for essence forever. You understand immediately that since you're interested in super resolution and in telling at which distances are two objects, and one of them is disappearing due to photo bleaching, your experiment is off. I mean, so it doesn't matter. So you really have to take care of this aspect. So you want to find ways for reducing. So sorry for this uh, list. I am not interested in this now. Um, but I'm interested in telling you about the current method developed by Stefanel, and that is the current method of Ilaria Testa in, his new, in her new group in Stockholm. She's also looking for people there, and she comes from our lab, very proud about this. Uh, why not using the donut shape beam for inducing photo switching instead of depletion? So the process of depletion has a very low probability. But the process of photoswitching, due to the characteristic of the molecule, has a very high probability or a very high cross-section. And so you really need less light to do this. There are some drawbacks. One of the drawbacks that I see, maybe you know better than me about this, is that uh, since you are using photo switching and the time scale is not picosecond like in the depletion, but is microseconds, the system is more sensitive to changes in the environment. And so I have to use a smart second, a smart donut intensity that is adapted to the different condition changing in order to get the very same shrinking point by point. So this is my only my point about this. Uh, so if you play this game, uh, this again is an open access paper you can find on my cross resolution technique. Uh, you can play a game like the one done by Laria Testa with nanoscopy or living brain slices using low light levels. But now, even if I have, again, some other things to tell you, but let me bring you again to this aspect, perturbation. Is there any chance you have to reduce the intensity of the second beam? I mean, if you reduce the intensity of the second beam, the probability you have to push the molecule down to the ground state decreases. This means that graphically, you can imagine that you have the molecules that you're interested in that are passing in the center. You do nothing. But other molecules passing through periphery. Let's have this graphical in mind. Can we use now time for getting information about their position? Well, this is what you do with children when there is a thunderstorm. If you count, so if you use time, you can get information from the distance, so spatial information. And uh, you can, as scientists, you can really be very sharp in this because you can also take care of the temperature, for example, so of the environmental conditions in doing this. Your counting and calculation, fine. What about the fluorescent molecules? Well, which is the property which is the characteristic that I am affecting using such a perturbation? I give the molecule an, one additional chance to go to the ground state. The final effect is that lifetime fluorescence is shortened. And so I send the excitation, thunderstorm, I start counting, and when I do not collect photos arriving too early because they come from the perturbation in the donut. The ones coming with the right lifetime are the ones I'm doing nothing that comes from the center of the donut. 
And so I can use this temporal information for, so this is what's going on in terms of light time, center and periphery, for building my image. is what I can get when I use this gated uh, acquisition. This means, practically speaking, if you need 600 milliwatt for getting 40 nanometer resolution, using this approach, you can need 50, 50 nanometers, not 600, for getting the very same resolution. Stop. Nothing more. OK. Sorry for being fast here. OK, this is. 50 milliwatt for doing the same. Uh, you can perform this also using two photon excitation. But now, I have a guy from Catania in my lab. And most of us are from Genoa. And uh, we don't like wasting energy when we spend a lot of money for producing it. And uh, Luca Lanzano immediately came in tune with us. The point is now. In order to improve resolution, to have uh, the very same resolution at the reduced amount of intensity of the donut beam, I select photons with the time of arrival time. Instead of uh, not collecting them, why not classifying them with the time of arrival? And so it, we decided to use this approach. And in collecting photons, instead of removing them from the image. We remove them from the final image, but we collect them. And so we have information about uh, their space position, spatial position. So this is the steady image. This is the confocal image. And since we are performing this game, modulating excitation and collecting in a correlated way, when we have uncorrelated signal, this comes from the background. And so we are able to have the background shape that we can subtract. So we can further improve contrast in our images. So this is the confocal, this is gated, and this is what is called split. I have no time. My chairman is uh, watching the clock. Well, just two minutes, but uh, no, yes, two, I think 30. Uh, also, I want to bring to your attention this, uh, to photon, because it's interesting to go to two photon excitation. You can use also, there are a lot of people using adaptive optics. I like all of them, but we don't use it at the moment. Now, with two photon, you can go deep, OK? Now, you need a second beam for shrinking. If this second beam has a different wavelength, there is a different distortion when you bring this deep in your system with respect to the excitation beam. You can calculate this. You can do something. I'm not saying you cannot do anything. But what about using the very same wavelength for exciting and depleting? In this case, I'm sure that I'm bringing in the very same position the donut beam and the excitation beam. And this is what we did, and we got uh, this result. How did we manage? So in two photon, I have a red beam, OK? When I have this red beam with very short pulses, I have uh, a very high density of photon that allow me to induce two photon excitation. So 100 femtosecond pulse width, and I can induce the two photon excitation because in this temporal window, I have a very large amount of photon. If I broaden the pulse width down to 200 picosecond, I don't have this chance. This chance is very poor because I have a not very high density of photon. So I cannot induce two photon excitation. But I have the appropriate number of photon for inducing a depletion. And so I use the very same wavelength that is in the red 
for performing depletion with a branch of the beam at 100 picosecond and with the other one, 100 femtosecond for inducing to photon excitation. You can find uh, some information about developments in these papers. And I think that uh, I'm at the end, but uh, may I ask you three minutes more? Just to move to something that is cheaper than STED and can give you an improvement like the expansion microscopy that is around two, 2.5 times in terms of resolution. Ah, sorry. This comes, I will be very short. It's very simple, so nothing. Now, one of the advantages of uh, super-resolved methods is that uh, in several commercial microscopes, and also in your own setup, there is an improved technical ability in managing different optical and electronic components because they come with a super-resolution. For example, the second beam. Now, we decided to use the second beam not for the plating, but a second beam, very cheap, with a normal laser, the very same we use for excitation, for exciting. So you have uh, excitation with your round-shaped beam, excitation with your donut-shaped beam, and then if you subtract what you are doing in terms of excitation, you can be sharper than exciting only with a round-shaped beam. Subtraction is complicated. And the factor that you use is uh, not so easy to be found. We discussed a lot with Colin, with many other in the lab. And as you can see here, a uh, different solution came out. Then there was a guy, one of the researchers is Xenia Korobczewskaya. She is married with a robotic guy, Chinese guy. And this guy had a problem. In his robot, he had to find a way for subtracting information while the robot was walking and terrain was changing. So it was something differential. So the robot was moving, and he had to adapt to the robot to the terrain. And he was using something in a subtractive way. But since terrain ch changes in an unpredictable way, he couldn't use a blocked alpha, a blocked factor of subtraction. He used a dynamic one that is this one, and we decided to use the very same for subtracting the effect of the, stead, of the donut beam to the second image. What is nice, what I like from this uh, approach, is that you can use this method to any method. So you can use this for fluorescence, for reflection, for two photon, for second harmonic, and you get an improvement in terms of contrast or resolution that is not very high, but for some questions, could be something that can help you in deciphering better what's going on in your image in a very cheap way that is uh, managing the second beam. And you can perform this also in the third axis. For those of you interested in correlative in, um, nanoscopy, there are also some approaches combining atomic force microscopy instead. But we will not discuss about them now. In case you're interested, we can discuss later or in the coffee break. So I think that I can stop here, more or less in time, and waiting for your questions or discussion at the coffee break time or lunch time or now. Thank you very much for your attention.